All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. We're going to have um, John Boylan from the Dulles Chamber um, welcome us here today. John. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm John Boylan, president of the Dulles Chamber of Commerce. Really excited to uh, be part of this session today. So just wanted to welcome everybody, especially thank our panelists for their help in putting this together. The chamber uh, seated, seated right around the Dulles region. Of course, the Dulles International Airport is a gateway for the region into uh, having the international community. And I think the global economy is going to what will pull us out of this pandemic effort. And we were lucky to have two folks from Loudoun uh, and Fairfax uh, County as they do their international business. They like to bring businesses here. The next best thing to getting a business to come here is to use the individuals. And I think there's a lot of power in that. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jan Mool, who leads our international business committee and, uh, and also put in a plug if anybody's interested in joining the chamber, uh, we'd welcome your uh, interest. Jan. Thank you, John. Good to have you back and uh, good afternoon, everybody. As John mentioned, my name is Jan Mull. I'm the International Business Investment Director for the Fairfax County EDA. And on the other side of my background, you can see the Dulles Regional Chamber that I serve on the board and also here as chair of the International Business Council. Um, our county or our committee motto is basically getting engaged in a global dialogue. We have been quite active uh, since basically 2019, so pre-COVID and over Zoom. As a matter of fact, uh, we never slowed down. It was not because of COVID, because the audience is global. So we always used already this platform for having this dialogue. Uh, recently, we had a couple of great events. We were in Korea talking about business opportunities in Korea, as well as here in Northern Virginia. And earlier last year, we had a session on West Africa. Today, we talk about uh, the international student retention and workforce development in our region. And I'm very excited about this topic. But before Aaron, uh, you take the mic. I would like to introduce Ian Chun from Envoi because as John mentioned, we have right in the middle Dallas International Airport, a very key asset for our region. With that, Ian, take it away. Thank you very much, Jan. And uh, again, as Jan said, Ian Chung with the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority. We own and operate Reagan National and Dulles International Airports. And as such, we uh, really appreciate the longstanding partnership with the Dulles Regional Chamber. Um, as the global gateway to the Washington region, we are very proud to have uh, more than 37 airlines. Um, and I will throw up my screen here so that you will see here serving more than 58 nonstop destinations worldwide. And when we talk about the international community, it cannot be overstated how much uh, we appreciate our partnerships and role here uh, in being the, the doorway to the region for international folks. Um, and importantly, and I think a sign of how important we are internationally in the world, is that during the COVID crisis, we saw two things that I think are important. One of which is that international students uh, were an important part of the first phase when the pandemic came in, we saw what are called repatriation flights, where countries brought in special chartered flights to bring their citizens home. And we saw airlines coming in here from parts of the world that didn't even normally have direct flights, be it Vietnam, Pakistan, or other parts of the world, um, in order to make sure that their international students who are normally here were making it home. Thousands and thousands of folks were making their way through the airport. Importantly though, as the campuses reopened, as the borders reopened, what we saw is those folks flowing back in. And I think that's been a real motor to our recovery and that continues ongoing. We're even seeing airlines uh, adding new flights to destinations we haven't even had before. That means that this summer you're going to see new flights to places as diverse as Amman, Jordan, and Berlin. Um, so ongoing growth, ongoing recovery, and because of that, we're really happy to be part of these types of dynamic discussions and talking about uh, this international community. So you know, with that, I'd like to hand it back over here to Aaron Miller, who's going to be your moderator today, um, but you know, very proud to be part of everything today. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and, and thank you, Jan. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Bob Ganji, who was uh, really instrumental in getting this topic um, and fleshing out the ideas here to this uh, topic. So um, really excited to be with you here today. Um, I'm, you know, this, this panel, before I start uh, introducing our panelists and get started, I just wanna provide a, a brief overview about my, my day job. I am on the uh, International Committee of the Dulles uh, Regional Chamber of Commerce. 
uh, with Jan and many of the others. Um, but I also work as the director for the International Business Development Program at the Virginia Small Business Development Centers. And at the SBDC, we help uh, Virginia small businesses and medium-sized businesses to enter new markets, whether that's identifying what markets are going to have the best opportunities for them, or providing one-on-one -on -one technical assistance in terms of understanding regulatory um, compliance issues with companies uh, and so forth. And we really pride ourselves on, you know, sitting down with a company, rolling up our sleeves and bringing all of our resources to bear to help those companies. A big part of that is our student research team. And I'm happy to be joined by um, Kayla Marinu, who is a recent graduate from George Mason University, who's our host here, who's helping us with the um, webinar. Um, and students uh, do a lot of the heavy lifting for our companies in terms of these in-depth market research reports. And we've really, um, I'm particularly passionate just about this topic today because my program has benefited so much from international students throughout the years. So not including the many uh, foreign born students who have come through my program as you know, naturalized US citizens or they're on a green card or something. I've had uh, the benefit of uh, working with students from Angola, from the Philippines, from Rwanda, from Senegal, from Vietnam, and, and another 20 some countries as well. Um, you know, one of the things that international students really bring uh, to the benefit of our Virginia companies is that unique perspective. They bring an insight and analysis that's, you know, grounded in their linguistic and cultural upbringing that benefits our Virginia companies and allows, allows us to provide that company with that kind of initial gut check of this might or might not work in this environment, or these are the obstacles that you're going to face that you're not going to read about this in an industry journal per se. Moreover, they bring incredible professional networks with them. So these networks and connections, many of our international students come from uh, very privileged backgrounds in their own home countries and are able to bring those uh, dynamic networks to help our companies to expand overseas. On a macro level, of course, the contributions of international students go well beyond that. And they bring a vibrancy to our campuses and make, uh, make the college, college experience what it is here in the US today. Moreover, they're a big driver of our economic success. And uh, according, I just wanted to share a few statistics uh, here, but according to NAFSA, which is uh, the International Educators Association, in the school year of 2019 and 2020, more than 20,000 students studied in Virginia. And those 20,000 international students supported more than 8,000 jobs here in Virginia. And they brought in more than $700 million to our Virginia economy. So this is really big business at the aggregate level. So it's, it could be one-offs, uh, seemingly one-off uh, contributions. But when you total this, this is really um, significant economic impact to our region. Uh, George Mason University uh, and the Northern Virginia Community College, which is really a, a powerhouse punching well above uh, their weight when it looks at other universities in Virginia. The two of these higher education institutions brought in are responsible for more than 2000 jobs and more than $200 million in economic impact. Um, so those are just, just international students here in this, in this Northern Virginia region through these two institutions. Of course, the overwhelming majority of these talented students, when they graduate, they return home. And some of this is by uh, design and opportunities that exist in, in their own countries. But a lot of times this is not what the international student graduate wants to do, nor what the business community is, is necessarily um, asking for as well. 
Later, you'll hear from uh, Mike Batt, who uh, leads the uh, talent initiative for Fairfax County uh, EDA, and you'll hear just about how many positions are open in our region. And many of these uh, positions are asking for people who have these really highly technical skills and backgrounds and degrees. So we know that there is an opportunity for international students. There's a match uh, with our business community, and we're excited to hopefully push the needle in that direction. So today we're going to learn about the opportunities, but we're also going to learn about some of the processes that businesses uh, need to understand in order to hire an international student. We're also going to hear from our university uh, representatives about, you know, the resources that are available, the composition of the international students at their campuses, and then also some, some best practices for our international students about how to talk to employers about, um, you know, whether they're on an OPT or a STEM OPT, and, and we'll get into these definitions here in a little bit, um, but really how you can put your best foot forward for some of these. So we'll start off uh, with our first speaker is uh, Stacy Bustillos, and Stacy is the Associate Director of the International Student Services and the Office of International Education and Sponsored Programs at the Northern Virginia Community College. She oversees recruitment, admission, and advising of F1 students. Uh, she has a tremendous background in academic and cultural exchanges. And uh, we both graduated from Miami University in Ohio, which is kind of a, a random fact about us. So Stacy. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, go Miami. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to join you today. And thanks to SBDC and the Dallas Regional Chamber for putting this timely event together. It's actually really nice to get out of the international higher education bubble and have conversations like these to start thinking about um, thinking outside the box and how we can connect our international students more directly to opportunities uh, with our local business communities. So I'm eager to share um, some of NOVA's perspective and see what we might find uh, in new areas of connections among this group here today, actually. Um, so as part of the recruitment and the admissions process of international students, we spend a lot of time enticing students with the dream of achieving a U.S. bachelor's degree and finding valuable work experiences in the U.S. So it is important for us um, on the education side to better understand what the opportunities are available to our students, particularly in the Northern Virginia region, as this also helps us to better promote the programs and the opportunities um, to our prospective students and our current students. Um, so I wanted to briefly give you an overview of how NOVA is recruiting and supporting our international student population. And currently right now at NOVA, we are enrolling close to 700 international students who are here on F1 student visas coming from 97 countries. Sadly, it was double that several years ago, and I won't get into all the reasons of why it, it's dropping, but you can imagine, um, imagine why. Uh, but we're on the upswing. We're currently um, registering and enrolling students, new students that come in for the spring. I think we're, we've got about 120, 130 new students already uh, registered, so they're trickling back in, uh, which is great. But historically, our uh, international student populations at NOVA have been largely uh, enrolled at our Annandale and Alexandria campuses. Uh, given the, the proximity to DC, but we have seen a steady growth of F1 students um, coming out at our uh, Bowden campus in Sterling uh, over the past several years. Uh, the international students that come to us are largely focused on uh, what we call an alternative pathway to the U.S. bachelor's degree, right? So they found that community colleges offer more affordable tuition. We have intensive English language programs and honestly, um, a much easier admissions process. It takes a while for me to explain that to students because they truly don't understand that it's that easy uh, because we are an open admissions institution. Um, so that takes some time to convince students um, that that is possible for them to, to start at a community college. And as you may have imagined, you know, community colleges, or you wouldn't have imagined community colleges would actually have so many international students coming directly to us, uh, especially from overseas on a whole, you would be correct, right? Because the community college model is not very familiar to most people outside the US as it is a uniquely American model within uh, the US higher education system. And it's morphed in its mission over the past 
century even. But even Americans don't clearly understand a lot of times what we do and the broad scope of students that we serve in our communities. But Nova's community is international and our reputation has spread by word of mouth among our many immigrant diasporas to their extended communities back home uh, who have in large part done the work for us by explaining the community college model and NOVA as a legitimate path to a US bachelor's degree. Uh, based on the Institute for International Education's most, open, uh, most recent Open Doors report uh, for the 2020-2021 academic year, there were just over 700,000 international students in total studying in the US on F1 visas. And of that, only roughly about 50,000 or about 7% of those are studying at US community colleges. Now, you, well, you may not know, but there's only about 1,100 community colleges in the US. And of those, only a small number um, have the ability to sponsor F1 visas and enroll these students. So as you can imagine, it is the community colleges on the coast and near larger metropolitan areas that are enrolling the largest numbers of F1 students. While there are a, a few outliers in, in rural areas or in the Midwestern regions, often situated near larger state schools, where you'll also find a number of international students enrolled. But over the past 10 years or more, uh, there's community colleges that have really started to put significant resources into recruiting international students, whether it's to further internationalize their campuses or to bring in those out-of-state tuition dollars, just like the universities. So it's not uncommon anymore to see community college representatives out um, on the international education recruitment circuit. Um, not lately, because we've all been shut down due to COVID, but there's a lot of you know, virtual uh, recruitment fairs going on on a regular basis. Um, and NOVA's in those, and we see a lot of uh, community colleges um, that are continuing to participate in, in promoting the community college model and the understanding of that. Um, but oftentimes, that recruitment process for international students for a community college requires us to explain in more detail what a community college is before we can even start talking about what NOVA is, right? And then we end up essentially promoting our big name university transfer partners, which for NOVA, of course, is George Mason. Uh, tech and UVA usually. And then the next question for most students and parents is what are the internship opportunities and the job opportunities um, you know, for, for my child once they finish their degree? And this is where many of you come in as our local industry, um, which is key to enticing students to NOVA and to the region. And oftentimes, you know, we tout our IT sector and proximity to DC, but I know there's more that we can be doing on this front. So I'm eager to learn what our business-minded colleagues on the call might have to offer in this regard. Um, what we have also found is that unlike maybe University F1 students, those coming to NOVA often have stronger ties to the Northern Virginia region. You know, as I mentioned, it is usually a family member or a friend that has told them about NOVA. And that is you know, what in the end has convinced them to come to us. Since we don't have dormitories, it's usually with these same family and friends, you know, where the student is staying upon arrival to the US. But as much as we try to show them a multitude of transfer opportunities across Virginia and the US, um, we are seeing year after year that the majority of our F1 students are remaining in the Northern Virginia DC area to continue their uh, bachelor's studies um, with George Mason by and far continuing to be the top transfer school of choice for our F1 students. Of course, that's the case for our domestic students, but I was just looking at our transfer data for F1 students and year after year, George Mason is our, is our um, top transfer for our F1 students. And finally, my last point, um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with what is called the optional practical training, uh, OPT for short, uh, but for every degree that an F1 student completes, they have the right to apply for a one year work visa in their field of study. So this must occur either during or right after they graduate. And I think we'll go into more of the specific details um, a little bit later. But what this means for you as a business owner, if we have those in the room, um, is that you can start investing in NOVA International students now after they complete their associate's degree by hiring them for a year before they transfer on to say George Mason University, where then they can go on after that one year of work um, where they oftentimes sort of transfer to complete their bachelor's degree. And then they'll have um, another year, a second year of OPT or more, right? If they do a STEM uh, OPT option um, once they've completed that bachelor's degree. So you could be investing in a student, you know, getting two years of OPT from them potentially. And more importantly, there's no cost to the business to process this visa as it's tied to their F1 visa status. So no H1B headaches or expenses. 
yet. I'm sure many of the international students will hope down the line that you might be willing to sponsor them at a later date, but this is a great way to hire highly talented students and get to know them before making that H-1B commitment. So with that said, I will leave it to, I believe my colleague, uh, George Mason, Dr. Yali Khan, to share with you the outlook of the international students at the bachelor's level and beyond. And so thanks for having me and I look forward to answering questions later in the presentation. Thank you, Stacy. That was, that was great. I had no idea that um, Northern Virginia Community College had students from more than 90 countries, 97 countries. That's, that's really impressive. I had read uh, before that Nova was the second um, largest community college for attracting international students in the US. Is that still the case? I don't know if we're still there anymore, but um, but we're we're pretty high. There's there's other schools that I, Houston Community College I think has the highest number of international students. They're at like five thousand dollars, five thousand students. But of course, they offer in-state tuition for their F1 students. So that's a that's also a different story we can we can get into. Yeah. Well, great. Well, we're really um, as a Mason uh, alum and a Mason employee. I'm certainly very happy that we have this partnership with Northern Virginia Community College. And I'm excited to introduce our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Yali Pan. Yali is the Associate Director for Engagement and Assessment with the Office of International Programs and Services at George Mason University. In this role, she develops and coordinates programs that help Mason's international community and campus-wide internationalization efforts. Yali brings some firsthand perspective uh, to this role, having been a, a foreign student in the US uh, herself, uh, where she got her PhD at the University of Maryland. So Yali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erin, and thank you, Stacy. Hi, everyone. Uh, I believe you're all business, mem business uh, members, community members, and also most of you are students. So I just wanted to say Happy New Year and welcome to this wonderful opportunity to discuss our international student hiring and address the employment gap. I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, like Erin said, I was an international student myself. Uh, so to me, this area, the international education is not just something I do, it's where my passion resides. And uh, because I know that the struggles, the challenges, and also the excitement that the students experience. And then also hopefully we can share some insight so that we can try to close the gap between the, you know, the knowledge and the knowledge of business part and also, you know, the desire of our students. Hopefully we can find a way to solve the problem to booster our local economy. Um, so uh, I work in the Office of International Programs and Services at George Mason University. We serve three campuses here uh, by George Mason University, Fairfax, as many of you know, and we also have two other campuses, which is SciTech in Manassas, as well as Arlington campus. So, uh, you know, just a brief overview of what my office does. Uh, so the, by function wise, you know, the office has two parts. So the first one is, of course, we do immigration compliance and then advising, you know, students need to know what their I-20 means and what it means to be remain uh, full-time status and then the, all the compliance, all the, you know, important part. And then the second part is engagement to team, which is where my team comes in and uh, we come up with programs and events and initiatives to engage students because at George Mason, we believe it's not just, uh, it's not okay that the student just come here. You are not just a number to us. We want to make sure that you have a very enriched experience at George Mason, that's a, your study abroad experience in a sense that you are away from home to study here and it's very fulfilled, elevated, and also you can have the best experience, you know, either from undergraduate or graduate study here. So I just want to give you a little bit uh, overview of the international students at George Mason. Uh, so based on our fall 2020 to uh, based on our 2020 to 2021 academic year data, we have about 3,000 international students. This is a little bit drop from previous year because of COVID, but we have about 3,000, you know, almost 
3,000 students, international students. And then that 3,000 students is about 7.5 of total enrollment at George Mason University as of uh, academic year 2020 to 2021. And then uh, I think Stacy mentioned a very good point that uh, how many students are on F1 uh, status. Because when we are talking about OPT, H1B, and then OPT is actually just a benefit to the F1 students. So about uh, 2,100 students are on F1 and F2 statuses because some of them, they do come with dependents. So, and then dependents, they can also enroll in uh, school for study as well. So among that, about 3,000 students, we have uh, many students who want to study uh, engineering. So we have 37.5 students who actually study in engineering school. Uh, and then the next most popular one, as you can imagine, might be business. So we have another 15.9% students study in the School of Business. As you can see, these two schools are the most popular here at George Mason. And of course, we represent about 130 countries here at George Mason University. Our top uh, countries, top 10 countries are China, India, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Vietnam, Taiwan, Iran, United Arab Emirates, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. So those are the top 10 ascending countries of our international students at George Mason University. And um, so I think um, I saw a question in the Q&A. Some of the students were uh, you know, curious to know who are actually undergraduate students who are actually about a graduate level students. So for us at George Mason, as of academic year 2020 to 2021, about, um, about 13, 1328 students, they are about undergraduate. And then about uh, close to 1300 about, about a graduate student. So the number between undergraduate and graduate level studies are about uh, the same. And of course, we have like into Mason, Pathway, Academic English, and other programs. So this is kind of a breakdown of uh, the demographics of international students at George Mason. And um, I think, you know, today we are having the conversation is because we wanted to demystify some of the parts that, you know, uh, so that's our, our business when they hear about hiring students, they do not just get cold feet or just uh, freaking out or panicking that, oh no, I cannot hire that student because the student is international. It's not necessarily that difficult or that challenging if you actually get to know the, the legal status and then what that means and what that entails when it comes to international students. Like my colleague from Nova Community College, Stacy was saying that, uh, you know, when students, you know, they are eligible for OPT optional practical training after they receive their degree. If they're in the STEM field, you know, in many cases, many students are in the STEM field and uh, they can apply for STEM OPT, which is extension of the OPT. So they can have another 24 months, up to 24 months of study, uh, I mean, of employment with you. So that means you don't have to do anything. You don't have to sponsor a visa. If you hire someone, they work for you for one year and then another two years, three years, if three years you cannot tell whether your employee, your employee is good or not, whether you want to sponsor a work visa or not, then we might be in trouble here. So I just hope that today we can contribute to this conversation and uh, help our business better be better informed and also help our students that, you know, when you actually go to a career fair, do not just jump into the first statement. I'm an international student, do you hire me or not? So let your expertise, let your knowledge, let your talent and let your confidence shine first. And then let's talk about everything else. That's some, that's some great advice, Yali. That's, it's, it's always easier to lead with um, you know, your strengths and just being yourself and then you know, we can, we could cover the paperwork and some of the mechanics later. And um, thank you for that advice. And our next speaker is really going to get into um, a little bit more of the uh, mechanics, uh, so to speak, of bringing in um, international or immigrant um, uh, visa holders. 
Bill Benos is the founder of the immigration practice and a partner at Williams Mullen Law Firm, which is a very reputable law firm based here in, in Virginia. Uh, Bill brings more than 30 years of experience in business and immigration, which allows him to advise companies on a range of uh, issues, including cross-border movement of people, visa matters of all kinds, ICE inspections, as well as complicated FDI transactions. Um, I'd also just like to highlight that Bill is also an adjunct professor at both the University of Virginia and the University of Richmond. And uh, he, he can maybe share a little bit about his connection with our neighbor up north as well at some point. But uh, Bill, the floor is yours. And, uh, and uh, thank you so much. Um, thanks to the Dallas Chamber and the Fairfax EDA for putting this on and to our uh, fellow panelists for, for such a great lead in. Uh, Stacy brought up OPT. Yali, uh, fantastic uh, sort of connection to encourage students to uh, uh, lead with their strength. And uh, when we were putting this program together, what, what I liked about it was that the idea or the theme of attracting the best and brightest from around the world to the United States. And that's certainly what the uh, community college system and, and Mason and the other universities in Virginia and, and elsewhere are doing. And uh, um, Aaron, you touched upon something really important. Um, and it's something that, that, um, that, that I think everyone understands, but it's the linkage between the students that are listening and the businesses. And that is uh, some of the, the, key, the key statistics. And, and a lot of this relates to, to job creation because for every eight international students who are welcome to the United States, there are three jobs that are created or supported. And, uh, more than 10% of the students who are in our system right now are foreign students and they contribute a, a great deal. And interestingly enough, uh, the Washington, Arlington, Alexandria metro area is in the top 20 uh, areas in the United States that are supporting OPT employment uh, after graduation. So that, that's good to know. But in a nutshell, um, uh, thank you for those kind comments and the introductory points about me, Aaron. But my main role is helping students actually get placed with <coughs> excuse me, appropriate visas with employers uh, throughout the United States and in Virginia and having work authorized employment. And so in preparing for this, I thought through, well, what are the main issues of concern not only to employers but to students and typically the, the main concerns that, that students encounter are the following um, how to get here to begin with um, and what about the reopening of the united states to international students during the pandemic uh, another one is for students who are here uh, and are studying uh, what is going to happen to the uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, DACA. Um, I'm not going to touch upon those two issues today because the Biden administration has been very helpful in getting students here. Even though there's been a slight decrease in numbers, uh, the uh, issues of issuing, the problem of issuing visas and the delays uh, have been uh, ameliorated to, to some extent for students. And uh, I won't really touch. Is DACA still is, is sort of uh, dependent on action by Congress. So what are the other sort of key issues that students are concerned about and enhance businesses? Well, number one is how do they navigate the OPT and STEM OPT process that uh, Stacy alluded to and Yali brought up? And the next one is how do they navigate this uh, process called the H-1B process? And that's something that uh, everyone hears about in the news, it seems to be the most uh, popularized or most notorious of the non-immigrant visa categories, and I'll touch upon that. And then the third one, the third issue, which is uh, a perennial issue for, for students and businesses, how do I, what is my pathway to permanent residence if I'm a student here? Uh, how do I get the, the seemingly elusive green card? So let me touch upon the uh, STEM OPT and the OPT process first and, and sort of give you some details. I'll follow on with 
um, the H-1B process and how to navigate that in a, in, in a few words. And if we get to permanent residence, we will. If not, then Aaron, I'll leave it up to you to sort of moderate. Maybe there'll be some questions that we pick up during the ideation uh, uh, segment of, of the program. So um, leading off with, with OPT, um, for everybody who's listening, uh, note that there are a few different flavors of, of OPT. There's pre-completion OPT, which is possible on a part-time basis. And that's a, a cousin to the CPT, which is curricular practical training. And then there is the post-completion OPT or optional practical training that Stacy and Yali both, both referred to. And from the student's perspective, um, timing in the OPT world is, is really critical. And it's something that you need to pay a lot of attention to uh, with uh, starting with when to apply. And so note that you have to apply uh, no earlier than 90 days before your requested employment start date. So that's an important date to determine. And you can apply after your DSO enters the approval for OPT for you into the CEDA system. On the other hand, what's the latest you can apply? Well, you can apply um, uh, no later than 60 days after your program ended. So the lesson here is as students, be sure to absolutely apply as early as possible because uh, the immigration service is taking, uh, taking time in approving, uh, adjudicating and approving these, these um, permissions, these programs, OPT, but most importantly, uh, what you all need and what the employer needs to see you have in hand when you show up for work is uh, you need to have your employment authorization document, your EAD card. And the EAD card is, is sort of uh, a really fancy uh, driver's license size card, but it's really your ticket to start optional practical training. Um, now, in terms of your start date, uh, that's something students and uh, perhaps as they've uh, discussed with their uh, prospective employers, as Yali said at, at these uh, fairs, you know, when, when should you start? Um, whatever date you pick, just remember you, you uh, can't change it after you submit the application because you're going to specify a start date on, uh, in your application that's going to be noted on your employment authorization document, your EAD card, and then uh, your employment authorized period will be for 12 months thereafter, at least initially. So that's, that's a key. Uh, another question that often comes up in the OPT world is, well, uh, I've been laid off or COVID has struck and I can't work or my employer has, has got some issues. What do I do with periods of unemployment? And the rule is that uh, you cannot have an aggregate of more than 90 days uh, of unemployment during your 12 months of OPT. So be very careful to monitor that. And if there's a lag in starting, um, keep that in mind as well. Uh, there are some workarounds, but, but uh, it's something that you don't want to uh, fall victim to because that your status and then your ongoing ability to, to go into the STEM OPT program that, that uh, Yali mentioned. Um, another question is about volunteering. Can students volunteer for some of the employers who are on the line? And the answer is um, they can do so. Um, uh, and as long as it's noted that it's within their area of study, but they need to be very careful because there still has to be some evidence of sort of an employment relationship. Uh, the last point I'll make uh, for OPT is, is meant to encourage uh, employers to take this on. And it's something that people don't often think about. Uh, and often employers have their HR people essentially uh, process uh, OPT students as other workers. But interestingly enough, because students are in a special category in terms of their uh, immigrant intent or non-immigrant intent, there's no obligation to withhold FICA or FUTA. So that means that the overall cost, although those are a few percentage points lower, um, uh, 
it is beneficial and cost more cost effective to hire students. And the other financial uh, benefit uh, of the OPT and STEM OPT theory of, of employment is that employers do not need to pay what is known as the prevailing wage. It is whatever wage they sort of arrive at when they discuss uh, the employment with the student. And that's to be contrasted with the prevailing wage that needs to be paid uh, to all workers uh, under the H-1B program. So that, that's, those are a few words about OPT. Let me tell you a few differences with STEM OPT. As, as Yali mentioned, uh, STEM OPT allows employers to add two years of additional work authorization to, uh, to the employment of a student. More importantly, it also provides two more chances for employers and the, and the student to be entered into the H-1B lottery if during that first year, the H-1B lottery isn't, uh, if the student isn't selected um, in the H-1B lottery to continue working for the employer in H-1B status. So that's, that's a, a more sort of critical point. But again, as with OPT, uh, timing is everything. And uh, the DSO at the school for those students who are listening has to enter its, his or her recommendation for OP, STEM OPT into your status record. And uh, you have to apply within 60 days of that happening. Um, and the, the other timing element that you need to think about is you have to apply uh, up to 90 days, you can apply up to 90 days before your current OPT expires. So as you're getting to the end of your initial 12 months, be sure you, you as students take care of those discussions with your employers and, uh, and arrange that. And I would suggest that even if you're entering into the H-1B lottery, go ahead and extend your STEM, um, extend your OPT to uh, obtain STEM OPT just in case you're not selected. Now, what are some of the other considerations with STEM OPT? Well, first of all, the employer must be an E-Verify registered employer. So sometimes employers have some heartburn about or trepidation to, to go into that program. But as students, that's something maybe you want to do a little due diligence about up front, because if you know that the employer is E-Verify registered, then this isn't an issue and you don't have to sort of broach that topic when the STEM extension uh, becomes important uh, and timely. Uh, the other thing is that one main difference between OPT and STEM OPT is that employers need to come up with a training plan for those two years. So that's something they can do uh, collaboratively with the student. But that, that training program is, is something different and it's not required under the OPT period, but it's something uh, uh, that's needed under STEM OPT because it sort of sets the guardrails of what, and it defines the activities that, that uh, employers and students have to go through. Um, lastly, uh, two last points on STEM OPT. Um, when the student files for an extension, uh, there's an automatic 180 day grace period, so they don't have to wait for the new EAD card to face a gap in employment uh, when they're transitioning from regular OPT to STEM OPT. So remember that. And that's a good notation for employers because they don't have to be fearful of, oh my goodness, the EAD card's expired. What do I do now? And the only other thing to keep in mind is that. Uh, the unemployment question that I raised earlier needs to be kept in mind as well through the STEM OPT period so that the student has to make sure that he or she doesn't accrue more than 150 days over the 36 months of OPT that they will be working on. So keep an eye on that and hopefully that is an issue. Lastly, on, uh, on OPT, I'll also mention uh, curricular practical training. We can pick up some questions on that in the Q&A session. But remember that uh, if, if a student is taking curricular practical training, which is uh, practical training with an employer during the, the course of, of their study, 
they need to limit that to one year because once they press one year, they may forfeit uh, the ability to move on to, to open two processing afterwards. So just keep that in mind. And uh, I've kind of focused on um, OPT and STEM OPT. Can I say a few words on uh, H1B or do you want to? You want me to save that for, for the q and I, I want to be mindful of time. Sure. Why don't you go ahead and say a few things about that here now, Bill? Okay, that sounds good. Um, well, navigating the, the H1B process is the natural transition from the OPT program that students uh, are in. And at the moment, we are now in year three of a program that was established under the Trump administration. Uh, which is the registration process, so to speak, for the H-1B lottery. Uh, prior to three years ago, uh, the H-1B uh, process involved the employer preparing, going to that expense, submitting it uh, on or about uh, April 1st to be timely and counted within the lottery, and then uh, a certain amount of time would pass until all those case, those applications were initially reviewed and then uh, put into a database for the lottery. Um, so that was sort of a disadvantage for, for employers. Now employers don't have to do that. It's, it's a much more streamlined process that works as follows. And it's going to be clarified in the next couple of weeks by uh, guidance that's going to be provided by Homeland Security. But initially, the first step is to for the employer to register the uh, prospective employee uh, into the system, into the process early in March. And uh, employers need to know that it's not something that the student does uh, while in OPT status. It's the employer's obligation to make the decision to, to enter the student into the uh, registration process. There is a $10 fee that's paid to the government. So it's not terribly punishing in, in that context. And uh, the selection process is based on the registrations which are received during the first three or so weeks of March. The lottery then is held on the basis of the database that's populated by this registration at the end of March in the last week. And notifications are sent out as they would have intended initially during the first week of April. So just be mindful that you don't, the, the time to act is think about it now, get registered in March, go through the registration and, and, and the selection process. And if the, if the person's application is selected in the registration, they then have three months to file the petition. Um, the one good thing that's happened over the last couple of years of this program is that they've ironed out the process of what happens when an employer or a student doesn't accept H-1B or pursue the H-1B process. And um, right now, there have been, been this year two subsequent selections, one in August and one in October, which have enabled students who weren't selected in the first go-round to be selected in, in those subsequent uh, go-rounds. And uh, one last point, just to cover some, some hopefully knowledge that people have, but in case they don't, there are two types of um, H1B lottery sort of applications. One is for those students who have a master's degree from the US institution of higher education. And then there are the regular cap um, case. Cap is limited to 20,000, the regular cap is 65,000. And when they go through the lottery process, they select the 20,000 first master cap cases. And those who are not selected, in other words, those who are master's degree recipients who are not selected in that go around, they get put into the regular cap selection process. And it goes all over again. And if numbers hold out uh, similar to what was last year, uh, it'll probably be one in 2.7 or one in three cases that are uh, submitted uh, are usually selected under these numbers just to give you a sense of sort of practice. So with that, I'll close and hand it back to you, Aaron. Uh, I know that that's sort of a whirlwind, but hopefully some of those details are helpful to both businesses and the students and listening audience. 
Thank you so much, Bill. Yes, this is um, you know, really valuable information for both our student population and our employers and navigating this whole new, new world of acronyms. Um, you know, and and all of the associated uh, requirements. It's it's um, definitely something we need a good attorney for. So thank you, Bill. Um, Mike, uh, our next speaker is is Mike Bat. Mike is the director of the Talent Initiative, which is uh, sponsored by Fairfax County Economic Development, and he's responsible for developing the programs and delivering solutions to solve the talent management attraction challenge at scale. Mike retired from Microsoft after a 30-year career there in tech sales and channel, channel management positions. So Mike, uh, we're excited to hear what you have to say about the opportunities here in, in Northern Virginia and the DMV region. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, hopefully, I can provide some good information for for everyone that's uh, that's on the call today. Um, as Aaron noted, I, I've spent a number of years in the technology industry here in the Washington D.C. area uh, with small, medium, and large companies, most of it at Microsoft. Um, and now, um, you know what you just heard is are all the all the good best practices on how to go find that internship or those or that job. And my job now, which I'm thoroughly enjoying um, is as a lifelong resident here in the county and the region and having a, a good network is um, the county is investing to help connect talent like yourselves to all of our hiring organizations. So that's my full time role. And, and I look forward to helping you and supporting you in that journey. Um, it, it's a commitment the county's making um, in partnership with George Mason, with Nova, and, and others. And so uh, we really want to help. It's a, and, and you know the, some of the um, recommendations you just received are really critical in, in that first step, you know, with Yali noting, sell yourself first, um, and then talk about you know, the requirements to, to get through what you just heard around the OPT and F1 and H1B visas. Um, and, and it was, it's, uh, I, I was glad to hear, you know, 35% range or engineering, uh, it's almost 16% school of business. I mean, that's a large uh, portion of the jobs that are out there. Um, and so let me share a little bit about the job opportunities, the internship opportunities, and, and really maybe where you want to focus um, your efforts. So right now in the Washington, D.C. region, basically just Northern Virginia, and DC, not even the Maryland side, we have 150,000 jobs open right now. Um, uh, there are also currently posted, and we have it in one location I'll share here in a minute, um, 1,700 internships currently posted. Um, I, I'd say to, to leave you too with, and share some, some motivation for you, some positive insights, this is a good time. The companies are motivated to engage and help because the unemployment rate right now in Fairfax County is below 3%. It's 2.9, 2.8% right now, lowest, one of the lowest in the country. Um, with those 150,000 job opens, there are openings. There are you know more than one and a half jobs open for every job seeker out there right now. So our companies really want to engage the international student community and 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 sponsor you and there's going to be challenges along the way so just realize it you know our, our government contractors which is a big portion of the employment uh, um, spectrum here in in the northern virginia area those are government contractors they have government mandates that that are going to require u.s citizenship so i would you know you know pro potentially probably just look at other options in the tech uh, world out there. Um, if I look, you know, and doing some research um, there, you know, when the H-1B uh, visa sponsorships, and those I think go along the lines of the F-1s as well, um, some of the best in the country for um, sponsors and getting them approved are right here in our region. Cognizant Technology Solutions has the, the no, number one um, largest number of uh, of uh, sponsorships and that, that get approved. Amazon, Tata Consulting, Google, um, a number of the um, uh, uh, financial accounting firms like Ernst & Young and Deloitte, um, uh, IBM, Capgemini, 
Gemini. Um, but a lot of our tech, you know, companies, if you look at Amazon, Microsoft, Google, they're very, in, uh, very supportive of, uh, of international students and um, H-1B sponsorships. So um, a couple of things I really want to uh, share um, and make sure I'll put, I'll put something in the window here for you, a few things. Um, one is our uh, site that we have, workinnorthernvirginia.com. Uh, let me see. Let me make sure I'm getting this out to everyone. I'll put it in the window. Um, this site is where you'll find 150,000 of those jobs. You can do a search by company or by, um, by uh, you know, just a description. So you can type in internships, and that's where you'll see the 1,700 plus internships that are out there. Um, and um, note that also on that site, January 27th, um, from one to four, here coming up in a couple of weeks, we have, we're gonna have close to 50 companies with about a hundred recruiters ready to talk. And they're looking for every, every kind of a skill level. It's a tech and cyber career fair, January 27th. Um, so we have pretty much all of those companies I just listed are gonna be in this, in this virtual career fair. We'll have close to a hundred recruiters they just those right now we have about 36 companies participating, but we'll probably get up to up to 50. The 36 companies we have have 7,500 openings right now, Northern Virginia. Um, and so, uh, again, be prepared, go to those, go to that virtual career fair and, and use that as an opportunity to to, um, you know, to start to have that conversation, to sell yourself and, and what you bring uh, and the value you bring through your education that you're going through, through your international experience, whatever it might be, and then let them ask the questions on, you know, do you have, you know, on the citizenship and, 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 and talk through that. So um, I love the, the comment that Yelly made on that. Um, if you, um, you know, I, I would say a couple of best practices around that is those are chat session. So if you're, you know, still working up on your communication skills and the interview process, know that this is a good opportunity that's virtual, it's online, you can start to chat with these recruiters and have a conversation and learn more about the opportunities with those companies. Um, and then know that those recruiters can shift to video if they would like. Most don't, they move pretty quick and just a good exchange that you can chat back and forth on, you know, why you want to work for that, uh, that company or organization, um, what value you bring, those type things. And then um, there's a potential they would, would shift to, uh, to uh, video. But that's just one example. And then um, uh, F1, F1 student opportunities. Um, let me put another one in the window here. Um, it's indeed.com. Here's a, about a thousand jobs in Northern Virginia um, that are um, out there right now noting F1 student opportunities. Um, so there's a few really good um, ways to get started, uh, but know that uh, this, this is this is the prime area for international students, international opportunities with great companies where sky's the limit. Um, a lot of those too, you can also search remote um, on you know, workinnorthernvirginia.com. So if you're applying for sponsorship and you might need to go back to uh, your country or another country of interest, a lot of these big companies have offices in, you know, around the world. So you can work for these companies, work through the, um, uh, the sponsorship um, process and, and find your way um, into a full-time job in, in, uh, in Northern Virginia or the United States. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. We're very excited to, to share those with you today. And I'll, I'll end there and see what questions we have. And maybe turn it back over to Aaron for, for next comments. Thank you so much, Mike. And wow, that's a, so many opportunities and, and you know, it's great to learn about the work that Fairfax County is doing and, and your role to bring these opportunities to light and really collecting or connecting the students and the employers and job opportunities together. Um, we're going to actually um, do a quick uh, round robin of questions. I've just asked all of our panelists to prepare uh, to debunk one myth about um, hiring or recruiting international students. So, Mike, if we can start with you, is there one thing that you'd want to let either the student or employer uh, community know um, 
that they might have a lingering myth out there that's uh, incorrect or, or an opportunity that they're unaware of on that? You know, I think for for this audience here, just, you know, debunking, a, you know, a myth there, you know, there are, are so many companies that that um, are led by um, international leaders, CEOs, are um, sponsors within those companies that uh, are there to, to be your champion. Um, so don't be afraid to ask. Don't think that there's not an opportunity out there for you because there absolutely is. Um, where I was privileged to work for all those years, Microsoft is headed by Satya Nadella um, from India, um, Google, uh, Pepsi, um, Adobe, many other companies help, led by international um, uh, foreign-born leaders that are now here running the most amazing companies, and they want to hire you. They're lobbying hard um, on in the U.S. You know, Congress to to open up more opportunities for international students, because as you see, as I, I just mentioned, 150,000 jobs just in, in our region right now. They're never going to fill them with those strict requirements. And we just know that there's 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 um, a lot of influence out there from major leaders in, in, the, in our companies to help. Thank you, Mike. That's great. Yali, same question to you. Is there a, a myth that you can debunk for our audience here? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll talk through uh, a, a personal experience. Uh, so one time I, I went to a career fair, I saw a list of employers on the left, and then, you know, there was two columns right next to the employer's name. One says, do you sponsor H1B? And uh, another says, do you sponsor OPT or something? So I think ironically, some companies say, yes, I sponsor H1B. But then right next to it says, I do not sponsor OPT. So I just wanted to, uh, to help debunk the myth that uh, OPT is not something that employer help to sponsor. It's a benefit that the students after they get their degree that they are eligible through the US government. So it's not provided by uh, any employer. So it's definitely not something the, the, the employer sponsor or not. So if you think the students is qualified and you're okay hiring the students for 12 months, or if they study in a STEM field and later they're eligible for STEM uh, OPT um, or the OPT extension, um, you know, then it's all good. It's, there's nothing for the employer to sponsor. Thank you, Yali. Bill, same question for you. I'll debunk two, if that's okay. I'll do, I'll do them quickly. Uh, one is who pays the, uh, uh, the fees for the H-1B process? Uh, can, can students or should students bear some of that cost? And for several years now, um, the law has changed and those fees must all be paid by, uh, by the employer. So that's something that, that's important to think about uh, to avoid any, any issues. Because if the employer, if the if the employee is forced to pay them, then it, it's deemed to eat away at the ability to pay the prevailing wage. The second one is um, the idea that um, you know, can you uh, pursue permanent residence as the, at the same time as as holding H one B or other status and uh, the myth is, well, I've got to do, do them sequentially and there has to be some amount of time spent in, in the non-immigrant status. Uh, for that, you, know, you can't pursue them at the same time. You just have to do it with care some, in most instances. Particularly if you're a student, you're not allowed to have immigrant intent. So if an employer decides early on that this person's a keeper, um, there is a way to work around that, but you can pursue it at the same time. Great, thank you, Bill. And Stacy, to you, you want to debunk a myth here? Sure, um, but there are international students at the community college level that are, of course, completing associate degrees. So that may open a different level of job opportunity. Um, some of our students are actually leaving with an applied uh, associate degree. And a lot of times those are, you know, industry ready um, students, you know, with their applied a science degrees. Um, there could be lab techs and things like that as well. So there is a population of students that maybe is not quite at the bachelor's level yet, but it's at the associate degree level. So is there a space, I guess, for students to have job opportunities 
in the region, where, you know, where are we, um, where are those opportunities? And again, building those relationships to push them on to get their bachelor's degrees and maybe hold them, you know, um, at the companies where they're at. And so looking at that opportunity to kind of you know, build that relationship with the students starting from an associate degree level up to bachelor's and, and beyond. Great, thank you, Stacy. So we have a, a few questions here from the audience. Um, I think uh, this first one is for Bill. Um, can you address the feasibility of EB3 skilled worker immigration for international students? Sure, uh, I can do that. And, then, and that sort of relates to the thing I mentioned about uh, the pathway to permanent residence. Uh, EB3, for those who may not be familiar with that term, is employment based preference category. And in essence, um, all immigration is, is put into pigeonholes in the United States system. Uh, EB1 is uh, one, one grouping for multinational executives and extraordinary ability aliens and, and so forth. EB2 is for advanced degree professionals. The EB3 category is for people who are uh, in classified in the category of professional or skilled workers. Uh, so EB3, if, if you are uh, to perform a job that requires at least two years of experience or a bachelor's degree, uh, so two years of experience or more right through bachelor's degree, then you fall into that category. And um, the main method of obtaining permanent residence in that category is through what is known as the labor certification. The labor certification requires the employer to get qualified U.S. workers in the area of intended employment. So the answer to the question is, yeah, most definitely uh, students can, can navigate through this. Uh, if they come through the, the community college system and have uh, something other than a bachelor's degree, they can, they can also pursue it. And there are ways to combine uh, experience and education uh, to, to fit into this category. Uh, the one uh, major issue that, that always comes up, though, in EB2 and EB3 is that uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of demand. And there are, as such, because of that demand, there are backlogs. There are four primary countries that are backlogged typically in, in this area, that is uh, India, China, Mexico, and the Philippines. And uh, those backlogs exist because we have per country limitations on immigration uh, in the United States. So um, Switzerland or the UK, for example, are allocated the same percentage of permanent residents slots as China and India, and as you can imagine, their population being so disproportionately large, there are more applicants than this, there are backlogs. But uh, to say today, Congress and Homeland Security have basically said that if you can get far enough along in the process, we can find ways to extend your status into the future after you, you get to certain stages. So the simple answer is yes, and, and if the person has a specific question or concern about EB3, maybe they can articulate it and we can touch upon it, but that's sort of the general picture there. Thanks, Bill. Um, another question, and I'll try and um, uh, get this a little bit more concise here. Um, there's a STEM major, they have less than a month left on her his or her OPT. My employer couldn't open a contracting position and I can't work with them using STEM OPT due to hiring regulations. I still have three months of unemployment time to look for jobs that I haven't used. My question is whether it is possible for me to leave the job early and start looking for other employers before my OPT expires and before I fall into the grace period. Does that, Bill, is there anything that you can, I don't know if that's. That's an interesting question. In the STEM OPT period, you can't do that because you're tied to a specific employer because of the training plan I mentioned. But during the OPT part, the first 12 months, uh, 
you are able to, to transition. But there are a couple of requirements. First, uh, first of all, and it's the underlying requirement of the OPT that I'm sure Yali and Stacey would, would, would uh, speak to as well, but you have to be working in an area that's related to your field of study. So if the other job is not, then it's, that's problematic. And the way that's regulated is if you sense that you're going to be working for some other employer, typically the student would want to go and be directed to their designated school official to make sure that it's, it's appropriate. Uh, and that's the, that's the guidance I would give to students. Is if you have a question, just go talk to your DSO first and make sure that either the CBIS record is annotated correctly or they give you some idea of whether or not it's a go or no go so that you can try and avoid this um, potential um, excess of unemployment while you're looking. Right, thank you, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, it, there's a question and I'm not sure who this would be uh, addressed to, but. I know there are organizations who are exempt from an H-1B cap. How can we find out who those are? Yali, do you have a, any insight on this? Uh, I, I can only speak from personal experience, but I think Bill might be a better or more expert to speak on it. Uh, so I do think they, they exist uh, because uh, I, as I mentioned, I was an international student before, so I went through the F1 and then OPT and then H1B uh, sponsorship. Uh, so my uh, H1B sponsor, because I was employed with the University of Maryland. Uh, so what happened to me personally is uh, there was no like a specific time that my employer had to file uh, to the government to buy a certain time. And then I can get to register and then they draw the lottery or something. So for me, it's, you know, they said, oh, it takes about up to 100 days to process. Uh, so what happened to me is they just uh, leave like 180 days and then make sure, oh, it's, it's about to be 180 days before her OPT expired. And then so that's just starts the uh, filing. So that's what happened to me. Um, so because of that, I did some research and I think it's uh, usually it's a uh, non-profit or like universities, they kind of fall into these categories. But, uh, you know, I am not an attorney. I cannot speak. This is just from my personal experience. Bill, do you have a better answer than mine? Oh, Yali, you're, you're on, on target there. It, it's not so much the nonprofit, it's institutions of higher education are exempt from the cap. Um, and so uh, there are, there's a sort of second category of organizations that are uh, integrally connected with institutions of higher education, which may also fall under that exemption. Uh, so that it becomes a fact specific analysis problem for the person who asked the question is, is there a list and regrettably there isn't. So employers usually know, uh, and if they don't know, they try and find out, but um, it, it is, but, but Yali's right, you find an employer such, an such as an institution of higher learning that will uh, hire you for an H-1B specialty occupation, they're, they're not um, subject to that and they can apply anytime uh, irregardless of the uh, lottery process. Thank you, Bill. Uh, another question, is there data available on how many of the students mentioned are graduate students on F1? I don't know if that was a, that might've been a question um, uh, for you, Yali, if you had a... Uh, yes, so, um... You know, because of COVID and because my office was a little bit understaffed, so we haven't posted the 2020 data report yet, but we do have the 2019 to 2020 data available. This is public information. So if you just, I will type in the chat as well. It's, uh, you can go to, at least for George Mason, you can go to our website, oips.gmu.edu. And then in the search box, if you just type data report, and then you see all the data reports. So it's available to the public. And we'll make sure we update as soon as possible. Thanks, Gali. Um, 
is uh, another question, is there, um, is it still possible for an international student who has used an OPT benefit after a master's degree to still apply for a CPT during a second master's degree program? Let me take a crack at that. Aaron and, and maybe Stacy and Yali can, can weigh in. I'm not a CPT expert, but I believe that um, CPT is available. It just becomes a little bit more attenuated when you get into uh, advanced degrees because it's a little bit less than the people are working at jobs to then um, uh, fulfill advanced degree requirements like PhD and so forth. I assume if the person is moving up, up the food chain. The other thing I would say is that uh, there are situations where people have not been selected in uh, the uh, H-1B lottery and perhaps they got, their program doesn't qualify for STEM, which is uh, unfortunate. Then they start looking around for, uh, can I go into a, a CPT program um, to bridge my time and buy me time until I get through to the next H1B lottery the following year. That's a tricky process and uh, there's not there's not one sort of single answer for that. Uh, it's something that is analyzed again on a case by case basis and, and if the person is contemplating CPT later on after finishing a degree and after OPT, um, that will be entirely dependent on the DSO and the program at the college. Okay, great, thank you. I'm gonna throw a question to, to Mike here. Mike, you work with all of these different employers across the region um, and large companies and mid-sized companies. Are there certain positions or roles um, where a uh, where there's less resistance for those companies to hire international uh, students and and recent graduates? You know, I think uh, not surprisingly, maybe it is, but but I, I think the ones that are going to be least resistant that they will be more motivated to to sponsor are going to be the more technical engineering jobs. The jobs like I had in sales and marketing, um, a little easier to find that talent. Um, but having the engineer, uh, having engineering technical expertise, um, they they really are thriving um, or, or struggling to fill those roles. And and so I know there's there's more motivation there. Okay, great. And I'm sure those jobs are are well represented on the website and the different links that you shared with us. They are, they are, and and as a, you know that that the career fair on the 27th is pure tech cyber career fair. So those 7,000 plus jobs are technology and engineering jobs. And it, can we get to that uh, job fair by going to your website? It's on the home page. Yes, that work in northernvirginia.com I put in the um, chat box for everyone. Um, that site right there, you go to the home page, scroll down a little, you'll see career fair and click on it. Um, and that will, you can register right there to attend on the 27th. Um, and you can, what's, what, what I'd recommend is, and what's great too, is when you, when you register for that career fair and post your resume, um, the companies that are participating have access to it immediately. So they can start to, to look um, through those resumes and, um, and find you um, and vice versa. You can go onto that site, do the career fair site and start to do some homework on those. Currently, I think there's 36 companies on there with 7,500 jobs. Um, so you can start to do some homework there. So you're ready on the 27th to start chatting and go to the right virtual booth. So if you have not attended one, um, it's no different than, you know, from walking into a, a, a an auditorium and you're in the main lobby and it lists every company participating and then you go to that booth. It's the same thing virtually. So you just log in through, you can log in through your, any mobile device from your phone, computer, wherever. And, um, and uh, on the day of, and, and it will take you right to the virtual lobby. You'll see all the companies you can click on, you know, um, 
you know, on Microsoft or whoever, and uh, it'll take you directly to that virtual booth and you can start chatting with recruiters from that company. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. And we'll make sure that we get the word out after this uh, webinar as well. We have a, a few more minutes left of our um, session here today. I'll have a question for Stacy. Um, Stacy, uh, can you talk to a little bit about the partnership with George Mason under the Advance uh, program and just kind of how that works for international students as well as um, just others, how, how that program would work? Yeah, this uh, Advance program, it's probably, let me see, yeah, about two-ish years old now. And it is kind of the ultimate transfer partnership agreement between Nova and George Mason University, essentially allowing uh, international or domestic students, primarily it's domestic students at the moment, but we're looking to push it more to the international student population. Uh, students can apply essentially both to Nova and George Mason at the same time, or I think it, the application has to come before the Nova student has completed 30 credits of any higher education studies. And what that means is that you're committing, your the student is committing to George Mason up front, um, but that also means that the, the student gets a coach, um, a George Mason coach and a Nova coach that work together to make sure the student stays on track. It's essentially a, a mentorship that starts that, at Nova, um, but is that ultimate goal of making sure they're on track, taking the right classes at Nova semester by semester that are going to transfer on to George Mason University. So this isn't, you know, finish your Nova degree and then transfer to George Mason, this is you are a NOVA and a Mason student when you're in this program. So even though we have students taking classes at NOVA, um, they have a, a George Mason student ID card. They can go to the gyms there. They can use the facilities there. They can even start taking some of their classes at a certain point at George Mason while they're still kind of um, based at NOVA. Um, and this allows George Mason to start working with these students. Um, and it, what we've seen is that it's keeping our students on track um, and it's a win-win, I think, both for Nova and for George Mason. And so what we're trying to do now in the next phase of this is that, you know, looking at this as a recruitment tool for international students. And so I've been working uh, with and talking with George Mason, their international admissions and recruitment office for a while now to think about how we can leverage this. Um, initially, it was to be doing these things overseas and doing some travel and recruitment events together, but that kind of got shut down over the last two years. But we have started doing a couple of the uh, virtual recruitment fairs together and partnering. So, you know, which is valuable to, to me as a community college at NOVA to be sitting next to, you know, my university partner, right? And we're saying, you know, we are working hand in hand. So you're coming to NOVA and you're transferring on to George Mason University. And for the international student to be able to tell them essentially they're conditionally ad admitted, right, to George Mason at the same time that they're, you know, their F1 is sponsored by NOVA. But they've already got that track laid out for them. Um, so it's, you know, it's one step better than just me telling them, you, know, you come to NOVA and then you've got, you know, hundreds of opportunities to transfer anywhere in the United States. It's kind of fluid in the sense of like, it's not a set app. Um, and a lot of parents want to know, okay, I'm coming, you know, I'm sending my son or daughter to NOVA, but what are they going to do after that? You know, and it's just me saying, well, there's lots of all these different opportunities, um, but this advance partnership allows us to say, you know, this is you are a NOVA and Mason student, you know, you're going to be handheld and you're kind of on track. Um, so, you know, we get to the point where students are then, you know, taking classes at both institutions. So there's some F1 um, where we have to make sure we're keeping track of them, right? But how many credits they're taking at NOVA, how many they're taking at, at George Mason, but we're figuring all of that out and it's working well so far. So I'm eager to kind of use this more as a recruitment tool um, and also seeing again, pulling out the, the data. Sometimes I'm nervous about favoring one transfer partner over another, especially when I'm out in the field. And, you know, I've created very good relationships with all of our Virginia partnerships, um, which is beneficial to, to Nova, beneficial to our Virginia uh, partners. But what we see, you know, year after year is that the majority of our students are choosing to transfer on to George Mason University. And so we're excited to kind of uh, build that partnership in the years to come. Thank you, Stacy. Yeah, I, I appreciate that as well. And um, he, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly biased, but I love the the relationship that we have here with uh, Northern Virginia Community yeah. College. Just one final question, and then I'm going to um, 
uh, we'll, we'll close things out, but had a question from uh, the audience. They say that they see a lot of job opportunities related to computer science and engineering and STEM majors, but not so many for non-STEM majors. And do you have any specific advice for those non-STEM majors? And I will, I'll start off and then maybe Mike and, and whoever else wants to, to chime in here. But um, one of my, my favorite books is by uh, Fareed Zakaria. He wrote In Defense of a Liberal Education. And in there, it lays out exactly why a non-STEM major is valuable in today's age. And I talk to a lot of employers um, and, and work with a lot of small businesses. And you are always going to need good writers. You're going to need critical thinkers in positions. You're going to need people who can connect different ideas and that maybe aren't uh, are, aren't readily uh, noticeable to those technicians that are deep in the, the nitty gritty of making a, a product um, uh, work or a, a technology work. So uh, certainly recommend uh, that, that book to you. It's not uh, very long either. But Mike, do you wanna have any advice? And Yeah, I'll just note that, uh, you know, again, if you, you, you look at those companies uh, that are hiring the most, that are also sponsoring the most. A lot of them are tech companies that, of course, they have the STEM requirements, but every single one of them has requirements for every other role you can think of, from human resources to um, operations to um, sales, marketing, um, all the business scenarios on, um, you, know, um, you know, partner management, whatever it might be they're all, they still all have those job requirements within those companies. So don't be shied away from, from seeking out an, an opportunity with one of the tech companies because they have non-STEM job requirements as well. That was what I survived on the whole time. You know, I was the sales person or managed sales teams, but we had the technical specialists that supported us. So it was a good collaborative um, opportunity. Thanks so much, Mike. Anybody else want to add anything or we'll turn it over here to Jan? Um, Aaron, I can add one, one little detail as a piece of advice to the students. Uh, I too am a believer in uh, liberal arts education being a history major before going into law. And that is um, study what you love, uh, do well in it. But from an immigration perspective, if you can add some coursework that gives you some tangible skills that you can use in, in a job that you can then classify as a specialty occupation, it always helps. So uh, it's great to have a major, but put in some some uh, some uh, sort of hard skill set courses just so you can say, here is my transcript, and, and this can help me uh, kind of make uh, the jump across the H1B for so good luck to all the students as they do that. And and, and, there are, and for those who are graduating, uh, I hope 2020 is successful too. Thank you, Bill. That's great advice. Well, thank you all for, for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to our, our chair of the International Committee, Jan Moll, to um, bid us all farewell here. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, I will keep it really brief, but I really want to thank the all the panelists for this this great advice i i learned a lot and uh, since we are living in such dynamic times i hope this panel with all the knowledge they have will remain accessible for the entire audience with future questions and i'm sure we can arrange that uh, also i would like to thank my entire uh, international business council for putting this together specific thanks to aaron miller and uh, and bob ganji for putting it together and aaron i think you did a great job in moderating this and uh, hopefully uh, People will go back to the recording if, if necessary. With that, I hope everybody can stay healthy and be safe and looking forward to see you another time. Thanks, everybody.